Monitoring is an important topic, which I've covered a few times in the past. So I've talked about how do we collect our Spark application logs and Spark metrics. And I've shown you how to do this with Login Analytics if you're using Azure and look at that example. Now there's good ways to track what is going on um, with that capability. There's other ways that I've, I've talked about a little bit here and there to track that. But in this video, I'm gonna focus on a different angle, which is what do Databricks system tables offer me for monitoring? I'll do very much a, at this point in time, here's what's out there. And we'll talk about what's the overlap currently with application logs and metrics. And then what other areas do the system tables help me monitor? Uh, my name's Dustin Vanoy. I appreciate you joining this video. Uh, I'm going to be uh, showing you some example queries and pointing you to other resources to learn more and hopefully stay up to date as this continues to change. And keep an eye out in the future for additional videos on these system tables as more capabilities are supported. Now, at the time of recording this video, I work for Databricks, but any thoughts and opinions and speculation are going to be my own. I'm not sharing any product roadmap, any public, any non-public things about what Databricks plans to do, just a bit about what's currently here, okay? So let's jump into how would I set this up in the first place? There's a couple of ways to do this. One is to follow the documents that uh, tell us how to call a couple of API calls to see which system tables are available for our workspace, and then to actually call and enable those. Uh, these really aren't too tricky to follow, but you will need to look up your Metastore ID and get a token to use in those calls. And you can do that with curl from, you know, most laptops will support that okay. A different way, which is a bit more baked together for you, is to actually run it from your workspace as a notebook. And so if you go and get the DB demo on billing uh, system tables, it will let you run that, get the token automatically, and uh, get started with enabling all of the system tables that are currently available. So I'll let you follow links, uh, check out the description for the links to try one of those methods and get going. Now, let's jump into my workspace where I've run a few different types of jobs recently, and we can kind of see the impact that has on system tables. Uh, primarily, I'm gonna focus on what type of information around kind of billing, or what kind of cost I'm incurring, and how to tie those back to jobs that I've configured. So I will take a moment to say, if you are a data engineer, uh, some kind of data scientist that's working in your environment, you may not have really thought too much in the past about cost, potentially. I really wanna encourage you, even if you're not kind of responsible for the top budget of all of the spending that's gonna happen in your Databricks account, you have responsibility to think about cost a bit as you develop and as you decide um, how to configure your compute and how to run your jobs. So these tables, if you get access to them within your workspace at, at your company will be a really useful way to just be responsible, right? The more we can build uh, cost-effective jobs, the more people will support us using this platform that we're on, the more they'll support the work we're doing. And um, obviously we're trying to generate business value in the end, the more we redu reduce the cost as we go, the kind of larger margin we have on that value, if you will. So enough about that. Let's go take a look at just a few queries uh, on the tables that exist right now. Let's start by taking a look at where we find our system tables once they are enabled. Within your Unity catalog, your catalog explorer here, we can find our system catalog and uh, see each of the schemas that exist. I'm gonna kick us off by looking a bit at our, our usage costs, which will be uh, leveraging this billing schema along with some other data. So let's jump straight to uh, an example query that I think is pretty relevant here to explain what we have available. Uh, definitely check the links uh, in the description for this episode and you'll see as links to some different blogs. Ryan Chinowith had a good blog about using this type of query and this is uh, modified from either the docs or from his blog, but I certainly have added my own touch to this. Uh, here we go, we've got the uh, usage cost CTE. So I'm defining kind of this table at the top that I can reuse. And I've picked out which columns I think are the most useful out of a few different tables. If we hone in for a moment on our from statement, we can see that from lines 21 to about 30 here. I am defining that I want to start with this billing that usage table, which is going to give me an hourly roll up of my different uh, usage and the, the pieces I need to calculate cost related to it. I join that to my list prices, which is over time, any price changes that happen, not necessarily specific to any special deals I have, but 
uh, for within the region what the list price is over a period of time. And so then I make this join and I'm able to uh, get the usage, hourly usage rollups that I have tied into my actual costs that would have been paid uh, prior to any discounts that might have been applied. So I've got the two things I've defined here. I've defined my usage type based on which IDs are populated. And then I've defined a resource ID, which is just a coalesce so that if there's a job ID, uh, that gets used otherwise pipeline and so on down the line. And so what that means is when I look through my list and I find uh, a job here, I think this might be my most expensive job if I uh, scrolled correctly, I can copy that ID. I know it's a job ID because uh, it's a job type and I just define that logic. I can jump over to my jobs page and I can actually filter on a job ID. And this is gonna bring this list and I can see that same exact job ID here click in of course and take a look at how this job's defined, how long it's running for, how often it's running, that kind of thing. Now in addition, I can obviously go and look at things from here, click around and, and view my pipeline. Uh, I can also then confirm which pipeline is the most expensive by going to the top of my list here and I've got a DLT resource type and I've got this resource ID. So. As I look around, uh, if I jump into my job, take a look at which pipeline ID this is, we can uh, jump into that pipeline right here, and then we'll see, kind of see it in the URL, and then we'll see it on the screen that this is actually the same pipeline ID that I was seeing as the most expensive, right? So what if you want to understand more about what these different fields mean? Uh, that's where you can go and use the documentation. I, I don't love to tell people, hey, just go look at the docs. That's why I make videos like this to try and summarize a few key points. But essentially, when it gets down to what's each field mean, what are some sample queries, that's where the docs are very useful. So this is the overall system tables documentation. And I can navigate on the left here to jump to my billable usage system table. This will do a few things. It'll define uh, the high level that I mentioned, it's an hour of billable usage broken down by resource and some other attributes. And then as I look a little closer, I can get a definition of each column that's included here. Notice that there are some uh, struct type usage metadata, and this is going to vary depending on which usage type, which SKU it is that this data belongs to. And so as you hone in on like job, job usage, you could actually pull more specific details out of this usage metadata struct. I highly recommend taking a look at these sample queries. If any of them sound in the ballpark of what you need to do, that'll get you a long ways. Now let's take a quick look at lineage. Uh, essentially, uh, if you look through the docs, it'll give you more info about when lineage gets populated. But if we're working with Unity Catalog and lineage is being tracked, I can go view a table level lineage, which will show me when a table is being uh, written to or read from, uh, who's doing that and what time that happened at. And so in this case, I've gone ahead and pulled all of the information for my full main catalog, but you can also filter down to a specific table name and you'll get back results uh, similar to what we see below. Column lineage is not always populated. If there is a source and a destination, it will be populated uh, at the time of this recording. And so go ahead and check on the docs to make sure you understand when that's populated. But this can really give us a view into um, how often things are getting changed, how they're getting changed. So that's where lineage can really fit in and be useful. And especially if you're trying to kind of glean some programmatic insights that you uh, would get from the UI by clicking around the lineage, uh, these are the tables you would use for that. Then continuing on a, a topic that I feel has been covered really well, so I'll include links to docs and blog posts about this, is the audit tables. And so I think if you have a specific thing you really want to know when is this happening and who's a part of it? This access audit is going to be really useful. Or if you are a part of compliance or security, obviously knowing who's who's interacting with different compute and different tables is really important too. And so this is just a list of some of the most important action names that I have found. And I can return some of the most important columns as well, just so we can get a glimpse at what's going on here. Okay, so taking a look um, at these different events, just ordered by time, updates and deletes are super common. 
I can see Run Succeeded identifying some of the jobs that have processed on my end. And similar to the struct I showed earlier, this request params will have more details about actual like job ID and uh, terminate, terminal state and those kinds of things. As we keep going down beyond that, we see uh, quite a few different actions that are there. Now, the thing I had, the first question I had was, what do these actions actually mean? So of course I went to the documentation, right? And I took a look at our audit log system table. And uh, in case you didn't catch it, if you've already looked, just to highlight, right here is where it says, if you wanna know more about these events, check out the diagnostic log reference. So when I pull up diagnostic log reference, it brings me to this page. I can view some workspace level things. And in my case, I'm probably most interested in jobs. A lot of times with the logging and things, that I've covered in the past. We're trying to understand jobs that we run. How long do they take? When do they kick off? That sort of thing. And so here I can kind of see the difference between creating a job, canceling a job, and uh, running a command, uh, run now versus run start. And somewhere in here we'll see there's like a run triggered for your automated workloads. Now let me cover a few tables that I'm not really showing in detail. So uh, we covered what's in Axis already with the audit and the lineage. We covered uh, all of the billing that's there right now. And then when it comes to compute, we have the clusters table, which is a, it's like a dimension table that's tracking history of your clusters. And so you'll see if your cluster has changed over time, you'll see multiple entries in that table for that cluster ID. And then you can join that into the node types to get more information about the different uh, nodes, the compute resources that are making up that cluster. So a quick view of our clusters table joined to node types. If you look carefully in the results here, you can see that we've got it. Uh, I've got it ordered by cluster ID. A lot of times I've got one entry per cluster ID, but then uh, if we come down here, I can see two different entries in lines uh, five and six where the same cluster has changed. And I've got a create time, a delete time. And as I keep going, I can see the different nodes and sizes that I was using. Warehouse events is a place where you can view warehouses starting up, when they actually start running, having that session available for you, uh, when they get scaled up and when they get scaled down. Now to take a quick look at warehouse events, just to make that clear, uh, every time your warehouse uh, gets started up, you're going to see a starting event. As it gets to be available, you'll see running, and then you'll see scaled up and scaled down as different scaling events happen. And of course, stopping and stopped when it turns off. Now, when it comes to other types of things that I, I don't think data scientists, data engineers are going to think about as much, but the marketplace has uh, access events and funnel events. Uh, so if you are using the marketplace or want to check who's using the marketplace, those will help there. And then the storage, if you are using predictive optimization, which really is starting to become a more standard practice to use predictive optimization, this would help you see more details about what's actually happening there. Now, an important thing about these system tables is that they're not updated real time. Um, so they're updated throughout the day. And at this point, if you, you take a look at the docs, it'll tell you that, hey, if you don't see it updated recently, just come back and check later. Uh, and then, of course, you know, more schemas will be uh, made available in the future, it sounds like. So keep an eye on those. I think we'll see more and more of the parity with what we can glean from the logs or from the APIs, if we hit APIs directly, start to make it into these system tables over time. When it comes to the Spark metrics, that is something that this doesn't really give you as much about the metrics and cluster usage as Spark applications are running. And so at this point, that's not covered. So as far as what we get from these system tables and how that overlaps with the types of application logs I showed sending to log analytics and other videos, I would say that we, we can get some sense of jobs that are running, uh, queries that are running at this point and tying that back to a cost, which is really useful. Uh, it's not going to give us like any kind of telemetry about exactly when things are starting and stopping and any progression along the way which you can sort of glean from some of the Spark, Spark logging uh, and that goes to Log4j. And you could also then customize the logging a bit if you want to go that path. So I don't think this completely replaces some amount of 
uh, viewing your application logs, viewing what goes to log4j. You do have some information though about you know compute that's hap that's running and um, the audit information will give you quite a bit of info about who's doing what and what's getting created, which I think can be useful. Uh, but again, it's kind of a different perspective than we know we have jobs running. We want to kind of monitor how those are progressing and what errors those encounter. Column lineage and table lineage is a good way to get a sense of what's changed and, and what's causing those changes. Um, so maybe a little bit of overlap, but again, it's a different perspective on things. So there's my run through of some of the system tables that exist right now and how I would query those to get cost information and some of that kind of thing. So I hope that this is a good kind of getting started intro for you. And I will try to follow up at least by adding to the description or my blog post with links to what is available in the future as new things start to become available for you. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to hear more about how we would use Databricks features, especially for those data engineers and data science type users out there. See you next time.